All right. Hi, good morning or maybe good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us on Zoom and on YouTube as well. I want to make uh, just one quick note. We are recording this session for your information. My name is Cecile Vernon. I'm the head of the EU office at DSW and I'm your host today. Uh, DSW is an organization that's working on youth and youth potential, especially on SRHR, sexual health and rights. And we're a member of the consortium Countdown 2030 Europe. And with our colleagues, European Parliamentary Forums of Sexual and Reproductive Rights, we, the three organizations, are co hosting this event today. We are now actually, we wanted to organize this event as a side roundtable to the Not Without FP Forum as part of the ICFP conference. And the idea is really to bring a European and an SIHR lens to the discussion. So I'm really pleased to be joined with really expert panelists, both from Europe and from Africa today. And before we go into the discussion, um, I would just really like to spend maybe five to seven minutes to set up the scene for our discussion. Um, after that, we'll have discussion with our panelists and we'll keep at least 20 to 20 minutes for Q&A. So please do use the chat as you are doing now to express your comments, but also put your questions and we will keep them for, for the discussion afterwards. Now, I think we'll move, we'll use some of the slides as well. And the idea is really just to show a bit and using some of the, the studies and the donor tracking uh, reports done by European Serious Society. So the next slide, maybe I can show you one of the slides. So that is our lovely panelists that we'll have today, as you can see. And on the next slide, we can already see some of the trends from donor, uh, donor in terms of European donors uh, and support to SIHFP. This slide is actually from the Countdown 2030 Europe tracking that just been launched last month with the 2019 data. And you see really a steady increase uh, from European donors uh, to support SIHFP, notably plus 13% uh, between 2018 and 2019. And if you compare to even back to 2012, at the beginning of FP 2020, uh, movement is 74%. If you look also at the next slide, you'll see a bit of, uh, of the breakdown. Among the 12 European donors that we are analyzing as part of the consortium, you have eight of them that either maintain or even increased their support to SIHFP over the, the last year. So that's really a commitment. And beyond that, you also have political commitments to those issues, either during um, at national level, but also international level and also during the Nairobi ICBD Plus 25 uh, Summit. Just to mention Finland, as we will have also a representative from the government, Finland has increased by 19% according to our tracker between 2018 and 2019. And this is quite noticeable. And one thing that I didn't mention before, but those increase also are quite significant if you consider that the overall amount of ODA over this period remain more or less the same. So it does show a prioritization of our issues within international uh, cooperation. Second report as a piece of evidence for our, for our discussion is the donors delivering report uh, for donors delivering sorry for SIHR report done by DSW and EPF that was launched in December 2020. And what we are looking at is the map that also showed the ranking of European donors on the side, and it's a ranking as a percentage so the SIHR disbursement as a percentage of the general ODA official development assistance. And you can see that some of the major donors, the ones that we, we know in terms of absolute amount of assistance of ODA, are not necessarily the ones that prioritize SIHR the most. France and Germany are not necessarily at the, at the top of the ranking, but you will see actually uh, Luxembourg and also Finland that actually prioritize more SIHR dismantlement within their, their international cooperation contribution. And among the top uh, ranked donors, you also see quite a lot that not only prioritize SIHR, but also prioritize overall ODA. Some of them are actually the European donors that achieve the 0.7 target of um, uh, allocating 0.7% of their GNI to ODA. You will see in the chat as well the link to some of those uh, studies. So that's quite stunning in terms of financial commitments. And just to look at the last piece of evidence before we start the conversation, Next slide is the Countdown 2030 uh, study. When we interview European uh, government and, and ask them about the future beyond 2020, what they can see as trends and commitments uh, to support SIHR. 
And what was really clear in the study is that European progressive uh, governments see SIHR as a full um, a comprehensive agenda beyond SIHSP, also linked to job creation, to decent work, to recreation, um, and to education. And that's very much in line with the comprehensive definition by the 2018 Good Marker uh, Lancet uh, report on SIHR as well. So this is, uh, this is the picture we have now, but of course there is something that's not on the slide, but we're all aware of it. That's the reason we're also only meeting virtually today is the COVID-19 pandemic. And we know that uh, has drastically impacted the progress we, we made on SIHR now, and will probably impact the level of ODAs, the international cooperation in the future. So this is clearly a, a risk and that could have drastic impact for low and middle income countries where you see on average about 35.7% of total health spending and close to 50% of spending on contraceptive supplies that actually come from development assistance. At the same time, COVID-19 has also put back health on the agenda, on top of the agenda, and within that, potentially also access to SI. So this is a bit of a mixed picture that we wanted to, to start with before we go into the panelists. But now it's time to turn to you, actually, as experts in the field. So I'm really pleased to uh, uh, join me in welcoming our three panelists. We have Tita Magia, the Deputy Director General for Development Policy Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Finance. Good morning, Tita. We have also Honorable Abdul Rashid Belko, Member of the Parliament from Ghana, also the Chairman of the Population and Development Network of Members of Parliament. Good morning to you. And Joshua Angwai. International Program Coordinator and Regional Team Lead at DSW based in Kenya. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us, all of you. So I will start with two sets of questions. You will have only five minutes each to answer the first question, uh, just to make sure that we allow time for the, for the Q&A at the end. So on YouTube and on Zoom, please um, do put your questions on the chat box again. So I will start with you, Honorable Pelko. We are, more than one year um, since the, the Nairobi summit, ICBD plus 25. You are a national policy maker that's really trying to advance the, the program of action of ICBD, but what have you been able to achieve over this past year? And in general, what can parliamentarians do to advance ICBD agenda? I think you're still on mute, sorry, honorable. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you All right. Thank you so much. And, and sorry for the hitch. Um, really, one of the fundamental things that the Nairobi summit sought to bring out was to ensure that um, we obtain political affirmation of ICPDs and uh, programs. And also within the context of the 2020 agenda for sustainable development um, in our various uh, countries. Um, we have in, in Ghana made sure we commit ourselves directly to the uh, objectives of the Nairobi summit and never has it been the need for us to commit ourselves to increasing budget and committing more resources in our health needs than now. And so the um, consideration is higher and the commitment of members are higher. Now, essentially, we, as uh, uh, sexual and reproductive health rights champions who are members of parliament, have increased their activities and have ensured that more and more we ensure government's commitment to higher budgets to health and to tackle do these very fundamental problems of, of, of reproductive health and uh, especially all activities that have to do with the uh, our our population and development issues now we have for example some key areas that we tackle the national access to family planning and products we are also tackling issues in removing taxes from menstrual products and also working very hard to ensure that there is a peer influence 
on each other in how uh, we train our young people in understanding their rights in sexual reproductive health and, and others. These are just key examples that we are, are tackling. And as members of parliament, we have a core duty to hold uh, the government to its responsibility by implementing budgets that are targeted at activities um, in dealing with sexual and reproductive health rights. That, that's our core duty. And we find it very fundamental mandate. And so we, we work towards achieving that uh, objective. And all the members of my network are aware that it is, it is fundamental to their duty. Essentially, one of the key things that is peculiar to our parliament is that many of the members who are members of parliament also have an influence in the executive. And that's good for us. So it's easier for us to project ideas into the budget or into the policy, general policy framework of government. So we work hard to secure um, budgetary considerations, you know, that will tackle activities of ICPDs in, in, in Ghana. And as chair of the Population and Development Network, uh, from time to time, you know, leading from the front, we work towards helping F MPs, not just to speak to the rest of us, but to do so with enough evidence that will help us have practical knowledge about exactly what is happening and also to ensure we build capacity of members, you know, opportunities to build their capacity to be able to do what exactly we want them to do. So these are very um, key areas that we are tackling in response to the Nairobi conference. Thank you, Honorable. I think you really highlight how the networking between parliamentarians, but also the role and the core duty as well, of in terms how they also networking themselves, how they can advocate within the parliament, with the communities, and also the, the government themselves with um, as well as all the aspects of capacity building and also information sharing. So that's really, yes. really good to have you on board to, to do Great. that. Um, mm -hmm. I will turn now to actually to, to Tita, to, to Ms. Maya from the, the Finnish government. So we've seen before, Finland is really one of the supportive uh, governments when it comes to, to SIH, uh, SIHR, even too. You make commitments as well in Nairobi on ICPD plus 25 uh, summit. I also forgot to mention that you also have a new humanitarian policy that includes SIHR. Right? Uh, mm -hmm. well. So it's quite a lot that you're doing, but can you, can you explain how the COVID-19 also pandemic affect and might affect in the future uh, the support for Finland or even broader what you can see as a trend for European donors in general? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me for this uh, important panel. This is a very um, topical discussion, and it was extremely useful to hear the Honorable uh, MP just before me, because I think that um, it is actually the political decision makers that make all of this happen happening. And us, like the officials of the government, uh, are tools for the parliamentarians and the politicians to actually make all of this to become true. So as we know, gender equality and sexual and reproductive health and rights are a very long-term commitment uh, for the Finnish government. They have been the cornerstones of our human rights-based uh, foreign policy, but also of our development policy for a very long period of time, which is I would say the first lesson that you would need kind of like a long-term commitment. You can make rapid changes, which is very welcome. But I mean, like in the in the longer term, it's good to have an overall policy that's kind of like impasses all of these important initiatives. And this is more uh, important than ever uh, because the SRHR agenda has been under the attack for the past decade to the extent that we haven't seen previously. And I have witnessed this as serving in our multilateral representations and permanent representations around the world. And uh, we need more 
uh, parliamentarians and we need more states to build the, these alliances. And I would say that one of the very positive signs, of course, now is the change of the U.S. administration and a strong commitment they have now shown uh, to work hand in hand with the progressive European countries uh, on, on promoting the SRHR agenda. So we welcome this uh, jointly. Uh, and then what can we do? I would say that uh, commitments are made by political leaders and they are kept by the political leaders. And in some cases they are not kept. Oh, I think, I don't, Tita, I think on my side, the image is frozen. I think we lost you. That was at the critical moment. You will explain what would be the magic solution to, to support this title. I hope, uh, yes, Tita is rejoining us. Sorry, we cannot hear you, Tita. That was a problem in your connection. So we, we, we just lost. Oh, there yes, was sorry. it. Um, so I think I... just for one, one minute, actually. Last okay. year we were explaining after the, the alliance with the European donors and other partners. Yes, okay, great. So what we can do now together is that uh, we can make really some political commitments. And one of them was made by our uh, Minister for Development very early on of the pandemic, uh, when he announced that all of our financing uh, for the COVID-19 response would be uh, uh, gender responsive and stressing that sexual and reproductive health and rights are considered as part of the interventions that we are financing. Then, of course, there is a strong kind of like leaning towards the disability agenda. It is very important for Finland that in the midst of the COVID-19 um, crisis, we would uh, kind of like address systematically the issues of disability. And we are very happy to see that these are now uh, heavily kind of like um, reflected in the general responses that we have been financing also in the agenda of the UNFPA. Uh, it needs to be said that many of the countries that we have worked with uh, in, in the North uh, came up with a very, very rapid response to COVID-19 in, in general. And I'm, of course, very happy to note that Finland was, was one of those countries. Uh, so we, we needed to kind of like uh, guide very, a very, very rapid process to channel more funding uh, for the COVID-19 response. But also to uh, make sure that the, um, you know, like already existing finance is uh, geared towards a gender sensitive response to COVID-19. And that happened actually in many administrations quite rapidly um, in the course of last year. Now going back to, um, you know, like to the Nairobi summit, uh, our minister made a, 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 a clear goal uh, commitment that we would increase our funding to UNFPA. And as you mentioned, this is exactly part of the commitment we made uh, and which we kept last year. So our financing uh, went from 20 million to 33 million last year to UNFPA alone. And then, of course, that is topped up by the humanitarian responses we finance by the UNFPA and its allies uh, for the uh, gender sensitive and SRHR um, solid response for the COVID-19. This is topped by uh, direct funding for country programs uh, uh, by our geographical departments. And then finally, I would say that in this challenging context, we need new openings and new openings come from digital platforms for health solutions. And we are actively promoting those as part of the UN cooperation. And we are very heavily involved in the generation equality process. And we are a co-leader uh, in the action coalition called technology and innovation for gender equality. And I'm very happy to announce that we are especially addressing the online violence, which affects women and girls much more proportionately than men and boys. So those are the things we can do together.
Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's indeed like we're referring to the Generation Equality Forum and the coalition is really interesting to see how also SHR, and as we saw in the countdown 2030 report, is also actually understood as a broader sense. So it's not only on uh, the access to health, but it's also indeed the digital aspect to it as well. It's really, really interesting to see how that links uh, with other topics and creates, mm -hmm. as you said, multilateralism and alliance and we may have time also during the q to discuss that because of course with the US administration changing, the landscape is changing there, but there are also other forces at the multilateral um, discussion within Europe as well, but also in Africa and Asia, uh, changing a bit mm -hmm. the landscape there. Indeed. Um, I will then move to Joshua, Joshua and why? So that uh, just move you, oops, sorry, to Eastern Africa. Sorry, I'm back, I think. Um, so we, we talk about donors uh, trends, but you also have a view on what's happening in reality in Eastern Africa. And you also do a lot of uh, sub and national budget activities. What do you see as the trends in, in reality and also in terms of the, not only for the donors, but also on the, on the domestic uh, resources allocated to, to SIHR? Okay, thank you very much, Cecil, for the opportunity. And I am glad to participate in this panel. I can provide uh, like um, my observation from East Africa and my focus will be Kenya. I can say that over the years, we are having like a, as a country donor funds have been increasing, but I can also say that in specific, DSW, we do budget studies where we analyze the allocations to, especially in specific FP, um, both at the national level and subnational level. So this particular analysis provides evidence for us for advocacy. Um, at the same time, we have also done a public expenditure tracking exercise because one of the things which historically, you know, we've been asked, what about the expenditure from the allocations? How much is actually ends up being spent? Uh, we have again gone further as part of the social accountability exercise to do like to implement community scorecards for us to have an overview about what are the quality of services provided in health facilities, what are the perceptions of the community members who are users of these particular facilities. Now, one of the things I can say that over the years, we are having domestic allocation increase over time. Kenya runs a devolved uh, system of governance where we have 47 devolved uh, 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 counties, we call them counties. And as an organization, DSW, we work in 11 counties. And I can say that in these 11 counties where we work, we have had increased budget allocation of about like between three, between two, let me say between one and about 10%. Uh, for example, I can give an, an example from the last financial year, the current financial year 2020, 2021. Uh, at the national level, at the same time, we have also recorded increases in terms of allocation from the government. Uh, when you look at the, the, the portion of allocation uh, for FP to the national health budget and the county budgets, you find about between two to four, between two to seven percent of the health budget is allocated to FP. And that is the same proportion, which we can say is actually spent. Now, one of the things which is really like a learning, uh, when it comes to, to community, the, 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 the findings from the social accountability exercise, and in specific, the community scorecard. Now, you find that in most health facilities at the grassroots level, where our work is supposed to impact the people at the community level, you find that they are in increasingly commodity, commodities are becoming available. There are more commodities. And then you find a number of health facilities are offering youth friendly uh, services where a young person can go to a health facility and then they can be able to access the services. Um, and then as much as we have commodities, of course the challenges still exist, uh, they persist whereby you find especially the long acting and reversible contraceptives are missing at some point. So to a certain extent, like I can say about six, between six and 70% of the health facilities, especially the ones we surveyed in, uh, in two counties where we are doing a pilot, we noted that they have, they do not have stockouts. 
So meaning about 30% of the facilities uh, are record stockouts. And then because of the segmentation where we have young people, we have persons living with disabilities, then we have young people who are girls and women, and then we have young people who are you know, young men and boys, you find that when it comes to counseling, people receive before they get the services. We also had like a perception where especially people living with their disabilities thought that they are not counseled as, they are not re receiving the counseling as they should compared to especially young boys. Uh, similarly, like young women also felt that they need more counseling for them to be able to even understand about the, you know, the, the FP and other product health information for them to be able to use it. So this is, this is like what we found out. And one of the things which I can say has played a role in like increasing the allocations and sustaining the expenditure is uh, I can give an example of the global health facility, which I can say is GFF, global financing facility, where the counties are given the, the allocations and as well as the national government, especially to buy commodities. And then the allocation which is given to the counties especially is tracked. The indicators are agreed upon and the funds must be used to, to whatever has already been agreed on that it is going to be used, addressing particular indicators. And then the timelines are, are, are also there when the, this particular grant has to be spent. And the more you allocate domestic allocation as a county, it means that the more chance you have of receiving you know, more funds from the global financing facility, which is the World Bank grant. So for these particular reasons, you know, such initiatives, they have made it like uh, they've encouraged, like catalytic in nature, whereby counties are allocating more resources and they're prioritizing FP, you know, because of such incentivizing on what they're supposed to do. So that's just a brief overview. And um, this work has been made a, a success because of the work in advocacy by partners, you know, the media, the advocacy through the budget making process where, you know, people are able to identify their rights and what they need, and they can ask for them to be included in the government, you know, priorities and plans for that financial year. So I think that is in brief, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Joshua. I think this is really good to also put in, in perspective what, what Tita, you told us about the prioritizing gender responsive um, action from your government and the policy and also inclusiveness with people living with disability and how this is also reflecting, might not be directly, but at least the reality in Kenya and in some communities with the scorecard that you did, Joshua, on how some of them actually don't work. And likely, and same way, with Honorable Pepo, how you brought also the need to include young people, to make them also include in the discussion, make them aware of what are there. It's clearly a link also in the work of parliamentarians there, not only at national, but also local authorities at, at some national level. So full, full style goal. Um, we also touched a bit about the, the situation now, but also looking now, turn to the future beyond 2020 or 2021. Um, and uh, there was just the FP 2030 launched last week as well. And I just want to, to turn a bit towards the future indeed, uh, the next decades. And I will start with, with you, uh, Tita Maya. In terms of the, how you do, you talk to us about your, the Finnish commitments in Nairobi and uh, how does that link to FP 2030? And there are quite different, um, pledging platforms or platforms to support SIHR, the GFF was mentioned by, by Joshua as well. So how do you see the, the landscape and where do you think Finland, maybe European donors will, will see the support for, for SIHR in, in the future? Well, thank you so much for the question. Uh, this is an important one, of course. Um, I, I would say that uh, there is a strong understanding that we need to, of course, increase funding or keep it at least at the same level to get, uh, uh, get re good results. We want more uh, coalition builders to join in. But we think also that um, mm, 
assisting UN agencies like UNFPA, to a certain extent UN Women and all the relative agencies is important, but it's also important to complement it by financing the civil society actors and civil organizations. Um, and this is what we have been doing, um, I would say, quite constantly in, in the last years, and we, we are absolutely planning on, on continuing the same trend, also increasing it, hopefully. And then, of course, uh, we know that the CSOs, they can work in places where the official development assistance always can't or, or the actors and we have good experiences of this um, I used to work as the director for Afghanistan uh, the unit that is uh, channeling funds for Afghanistan and we saw that Mary Stopes for instance was able to go to um, well I would say places where nobody else was able to go and it was very important to make that notion um, then, of course, um, connecting civil society actors with private sector is quite important. Uh, we see much more private sector openings in, in this field as well. And there are good experiences on this, on menstrual health, for instance, that we have shared in, in, in Finland. And then, of course, we need to kind of like continue on building new narrative on SRHR agenda. We need to kind of like resist this pushback that we see in all continents at the moment. And I'm not saying that this is a problem of certain continent. This is a problem also in my continent. So we need to kind of like uh, have a... Uh, a pool of a lot, much larger pool of potential supporters. And last but not least, this is the promoting the SRHR agenda is very difficult if it's kind of like not part of your universal health coverage. You would probably need to, or we need to look at this uh, much more holistically than what we have done this far. Uh, and I think that this is a sound kind of like lesson learned uh, for all the donors and, and, and developing actors, actors together. So I conclude there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, absolutely. It's, I think it's good that you mentioned also the multi stakeholder uh, engagement and having different type of uh, uh, actors. On the private sector, it would be good to also discuss a bit uh, what's their role, how they can help in terms of access to, to the supplies, menstrual hygiene, but also in, in other, what is their role on the rights, uh, guaranteeing the rights of the employees. There's a lot to, to discuss and then and just inviting participants to start thinking about the questions because this is more like a quick quick last, um, last Q&A with the panelists and I will turn to the Q&A very soon. And I'm actually going back to, to Joshua. You mentioned some of the commitments. Um, and some of them are, as you said, difficult to, 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 to follow them. And how do you make the, the government accountable to those when they are not always specific, time-bound, um, you know, smart acronyms, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound? So how do you do that as civil society? What can be the role in the future as also highlighted uh, with uh, Tita in her speech? I will leave you just two minutes, so we'll have time for Q&A. Okay, thank you very much for that. I, I will say it begins from the time the commitments are developed. I believe there should be a consultative process when we are developing the commitments, where whoever is involved in the implementation of these particular commitments comes on board in a table and then they'll agree about. And number two, dissemination of the commitments. Uh, we understand about the turnover, about the officials and you know the individuals who are uh, involved in their development. So I think continuous dissemination of the commitments and unpacking them on what it uh, they, they meant, I think can also be helpful in making the most matter. And then uh, the, there is a need for us to periodically track the commitments for us to be able to know, you know where we are. So this means like we need more, more of a monitoring and evaluation framework for us to be able to know exactly where are we and where are we going. And uh, one of the things which we've discovered has been quite helpful, especially in East Africa, is the development of some tools like I can, and frameworks. So like I can say the family planning, uh, costed implementation plans, which like in the, all the counties we work in, 
we have supported 10 out of 11 counties to have the coastal implementation plans and at the national level, they provide like how much exactly is needed. So they break a commitment from wherever and then they bring it in this particular document. And then we know how much money is required in a certain financial year for us to be able to attain this particular commitment. So it is split all of them. And then from this nas the, 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 the National Family Plan and Coastal Implementation Plan, which is normally like a five-year plan, annually, we, we extract the information from there to the annual work plans of our county or our government, whereby now they are at the lowest level where they are, they are tracked like annually, we are able to track. So splitting them that way is one of the ways in which we can make the commitments smart and we are able to actually track their implementation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for detailing the example in Kenya as well with the costed work plan. I think that's a really good tool. Not sure that exists in, to some extent in some other region might not be so detailed. So that's a good, maybe a good practice to, to, to know. Turning to you, Honorable Pepo, so now um, from Ghana, so turning to another region as well, um, Ghana has actually moved to a, a, a low, lower middle income uh, country already in 2011. And understanding in 2019, you adopted a, actually a, a beyond aid strategy for Kenya. So how, how can European donors uh, support this this uh, strategy from Kenya. How you can they can help you to 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 reduce the reliance on on aid while still make sure that SIHR is available to to all and even the hard to reach community. I don't. I think you were still mute. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, at the heart of the sponsorship of um, activities regarding population and development, and especially, um, you know, sexual reproductive health and rights, is the fact that the nation should have the capacity to finance the activities and to ensure that it follows an agenda that tackles it sustainably into a very uh, into the future. And so one thing Ghana has been doing, trying to do, is to ensure that uh, we formulate a strategy which is termed Ghana Beyond Aid. And this is envisaged, um, you know, to have a lasting value in which Ghana can use local resources to ensure that it stands strong stands with a sustainable, strong, resilient economy, so that in the end, you don't you reduce the dependency on, on donor aid. But that's precisely also the reason uh, these questions are arising. Now, if you envisage to have an independence, or let me say, a less dependency on aid, and aid mostly targeted as supporting uh, uh, your your SRHR programs, how do you then finance it? Well, the, the aim essentially is to ensure that we have all inclusive uh, package in dealing with all programs, including our health programs. Ghana has been fighting to ensure that universal health care reaches everywhere in the country. And it is the reason you have our national health insurance fashioned out the way it is, which enables all young people uh, below the age of 18 go free of charge, and all um, uh, you know cases of maternity maternity cases uh, in the hospitals are also free, and it is it is wet out to the point where with just a few dollars, for example, with $5, you can go to the hospital the whole year without paying for your hospital care. But Ghana seeks to be a wealthy country and it seeks to be an inclusive economy. It seeks to ensure that there is empowerment in, in everything we do and that we want to galvanize society to help in this direction. And in doing so, we, we think that we still will need support 
from the EU and, and other donor countries to support Ghana in our targeted growth and in promoting um, uh, healthcare to the people. What we want to do, what we think the EU should be doing now is to be helping Ghana in targeting grants in areas where we fall short of self-financing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, SRHR are not areas, mainstream areas in health delivery, as has been mentioned earlier by, by, by Taita. And, and because of that, you would normally not see it occurring in national budget without uh, organizations like ours prompting government and insisting on it being put on the agenda and so these are areas that we will require some kind of support and some kind of influence to first of all do a program of activities and secondly to support the financing another area that we think would need support to support the general idea of, of the strategy of Ghana Beyond Aid is to, is to um, promote trade activities in Ghana, activities that aim at using process, monitoring process that process that will come out of these activities into um, ICPD activities, so that we can we can monitor, track and ensure that when monies are realized, they, they can be utilized in areas like this, you know, to make sure that we respond forcefully to needs of the adolescents and the, the young adults. But finally, we want to affirm, I want to affirm very forcefully that members of parliament in Ghana will want to work towards achieving the best as we can in monitoring and ensuring that we we unite us we unite against um, anything that is going to distract the use of resources to fight um, the battle of providing uh, support for the growing child and growing adolescent. And I recall um, what Nelson Mandela has said. He, he said that our endeavors must be about the liberation of the woman the emancipation of the man and the, li the liberty of the child. And this is critical for us and my hopes and aspirations for all of us in Africa is that we help uplift the quality of life in society by making sure we support uh, sexual and reproductive health activities and especially the generality of population and development issues. That alone is going to guarantee our policy, strategic policy of Ghana Beyond Eight. Ghana Beyond Eight will not be uh, a possibility if we have a society that will not, you cannot uh, uh, be sure of their reproductive health issues, that we cannot control our population growth and we cannot match quality to population and development. Thank you. Absolutely. No, thank you very much, sorry. And I think it's, uh, it's I think we're all completely understand like indeed the, how Asaisha can help to, to, to do that and also having a more sustainable development and rights for all and make sure that also some, some opportunities uh, for young people are, and, and children and, and community at large are, are actually harnessed uh, from the start, especially looking at the, the huge potential of the youth population in, in Africa and in, in other regions as well. Thank you so much for that. I understand you're also working with uh, fellow parliamentarians on, on maybe a commitment with a letter that we can maybe uh, also share through our social um, social media after, after this event. I'm still waiting for questions on the chat box. Please use the chat box with the questions. But now I just have, uh, actually I want to pick up on things that you all mentioned before. It's UHC, universal health coverage, and how we can try to achieve it, even especially for people most in need, adolescents, vulnerable groups, people in the living hard to reach regions and all of this. So I'm just wondering, picking up on what you just said, Honorable uh, Pelpo, and moving back to, since we have a donor on our table, uh, to tip that, do you think without, you know, committing obviously finance or anything, is there 
Do you already have an idea of how Finland could maybe support indeed the other countries to achieve USC, which is, by the way, also a, a priority for Kenya? I understand. So how how can we do that, and how can we ensure that SHI is part and parcel of UHC as well moving forward? Well, thank you for the question. This is an important one because I would say that without uh, this, uh, the agenda comes to a stop quite soon. And it was very interesting to hear the honorable MP really to, uh, um, I mean, like very realistically uh, explain um, the, you know, like the cornerstones and still some blocks that you have in, in Ghana in order to take the agenda forward. Well, first of all, of course, money is needed. I, you know, like <laughs> there is no, no going about it. Um, you would need uh, to fund these endeavors. But then again, this is done in many countries already. Mm, so there are plenty of examples where we can learn from. Uh, mistakes have been made, uh, what not to do and what to do. And um, I always say that in the case of Finland, for instance, because we became an industrialized country very late uh, compared to our neighbors, it was a very good lesson for us to go and see what they had, what mistakes they had already made, because then we were able to, um, I would say, <laughs> avoid them and go directly to issues that are, uh, are of essence. Um, then, of course, we need a UN system-wide collaboration on this. This is not primarily a health issue. This is not primarily a women's issue. As the Honorable MP put it, this is everyone's issue. And the UN agenda needs to involve uh, through its operational organizations, I would say, uh, a wi wide variety of agencies. We need WHO, we need UNFPA, we need UN Women, we need UNDP to take part of these um, endeavors. We need to um, give guidance uh, to responsive governments of the South. Uh, what they need, we need to be very, I would say, attentive to the needs because the solution needs that the solutions need to be fitted to the country context. It was very interesting to hear our colleagues, uh, our colleague from Kenya, also to explain how the local system works there um, and how it works then in in you know like uh, in in Ghana. And I was able to sense very much differences already between those two countries. And I can assure you that the, how uh, the health and reproductive rights and uh, uh, health agenda is organized in Finland is quite uh, different to some of the neighboring countries that um, that we have here in, 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 in the north. So I would say that uh, those are the essential ingredients we need. Um, and of course, in, in the case of Finland, all of this is kind of like a, a combined quite, uh, uh, quite well to a public health agenda that is then run through by the cities and municipalities. Uh, and this, of course, is um, the model that uh, will ultimately probably be useful for many, uh, no matter how um, their public health uh, system delivery is carried out. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for highlighting the need for funding, but also partnership and having other actors on board and also not once fits all, right? It's, a, it's all very context driven, even within the country with some national uh, differences and, and different groups, different needs. So it needs to be really tailored made. And just to swing back Kenya before going back to, to Ghana as a response also to, to this discussion, Joshua, I know USC is also one of the big, the big priorities right now in Kenya, but do you, on this one or others, do you see opportunities to, to include SIHR in, 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 in the coming decades and even beyond uh, Kenya, the big Build Back Better movement after COVID-19? Yes, indeed. UHC is one of the focus areas for Kenya. And two years ago, uh, UHC was piloted in four counties in Kenya out of the 47. And now 
the rollout of full UHC in all the counties like is, is actually happening. And we see this as an opportunity for us to, you know, especially as the advocacy groups in, uh, interested in SRHFP, we see this as an opportunity for us to advocate for the inclusion of FP in UHC. Now, some, so some of the things, you know, we are looking at, even in the insurance schemes, can we have like you can go to a health facility and then you can access contraceptives with your you know with your NHA the, the, the national health insurance scheme as an example and then you know we are having you know other things like we, we have a program called Linda Mama which is especially for you know the you know the the, the bathroom process in the hospitals where this again you can actually go to a hospital and you deliver for free so there are some components which are still included. However, now what is happening now, there's a strong advocacy so that, you know, uh, when you go to a health facility where you are registered, you can actually access all the services there for free. In the four counties where there was a pilot, I think it proved to be a success as much as there was a gap in, in terms of data. Uh, talking about COVID-19, COVID-19 brought about its challenges where, uh, because again, now resources have to be reallocated to address uh, COVID-19. So there, there was a reallocation from some other programs to, you know, to COVID-19 interventions. And one of the things which uh, like Kenya did is that when they were developing the, the guidelines for addressing COVID-19, family planning was one of them. So that when you go to a health facility, like uh, because health, again, as I said, is devolved, in some counties through advocacy efforts. Now, SRHFP was one of the core issues which are county had to address. So meaning you could actually go to, still go to a health facility even during the lockdown where you couldn't get out of your house. But when it comes to, you know, to search, you could actually go and access. So because COVID-19 again is here with us and you know the challenges in which it has brought, in terms of access, people fearing going to health facilities to seek the, you know, the facilities. We are seeing again an opportunity to even work with the private sector, because again, like uh, you know, like the pharmacies where uh, people can actually easily walk because of fear of contracting COVID in their facilities and the and the stretching which it has brought. So where like now uh, people are getting are empowering the private sector providers like the pharmacies so that they can be able to provide some services you know away from the health facilities so i am seeing this partnership with the private sector you know becoming really key even the media social media in terms of disseminating information because now when people became indoors they you know many people were using relying on on you know on whatever they are reading online and everything. So we saw we, we are seeing this as an opportunity where they can actually see more where they can access the services. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for detailing also how that was rolling out in, in some in some parts of Kenya, UHC. Also to circle back to Honorable people, there was a comment also in the chat box uh, congratulating Ghana for also piloting access to UHC in um, in, in some regions and now moving up na nationally. Um, and there is a question to this um, that maybe then I'll turn to you to address and, and we can also, if we have time, address also the question of the private sector that might be quite interesting as well. So on the, on the question, um, it's really about FP commodities, what's highlighted by, by Joshua as well. And, and this the percentage, which is close to 50% right now on average that the, of the funding for, uh, for FP commodities actually depends on, on development assistance still. So what do you see in Ghana? How can we... How could we ensure that the commodities will still be available at price, even if government starts to picking up and then development assistance reduced on this? Do you see that in Ghana? And where do you see the possibility um, for government to make sure that the, the, it's still affordable and available? Well, thank you so much. Um, if I hear you right, um, we uh, Ghana is implementing the National Health Insurance Scheme, which takes care of the health of young people and the old, older, old people. 
Anybody above the age of 70 goes to hospital free. Anybody between the age of one and 18 goes to the hospital free. Um, indigent in society who are unable to take care of their kids are also free to attend to hospital. We also have um, MPs who are champions of um, uh, social, social health, reproductive health and rights. And we are multiplying in our numbers in our communities to tackle the issues of, 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 of SRHRs and to make sure we spread the message far and wide. Um, funding is critical. And as it is, um, mostly it is from external sources that we get um, more than at least about 50% of the funding for the uh, external activities, activities such as um, you know, educating and implementing SRHR activities at community levels. They are mostly done by um, community health organizations, community NGOs, and also development agencies throughout the country. But funding is mostly from the budget as well. And we make sure that as members of parliament, we insist in adding any funding that will tackle the, the challenge of implementing SRHR activities. And um, it is because we, we know that between now, I mean, at this very moment, in the midst of COVID, it is unavoidable that funding should go higher. Mm -hmm. it's, it's unacceptable that any funding should reduce in health. And we are keen at making sure we follow it to the letter and make sure implementation of activities are also monitored and reported back to parliament. So um, cost is a problem, but the little resource we can provide as a nation, we make sure those resources are released for the purpose of implementing a totality of health care for the nation. And so it is our avowed expectation that even in the midst of COVID, much more can be done. Thank you. It's, I, I just realized the time as well. I think that's, we'll, we'll have to finish on this note, but it's actually really a key note to say that there's a lot that can be done at the, and with a multi-stakeholder approach, like, like today actually having parliamentary society and governments together working in hands to make sure that SIT is reality for most and for the, the one that really are in need. Um, and unfortunately, we'll have to wrap up with that. There is a question on the chat that we've noted, and that's was from Joshua. So, Minwai Norma, we will actually respond to you by email on this. Uh, that was to ex expand a bit on the, the practice in Kenya and what are the tools that can be maybe replicated. But I think it's really important to also finish on the note on UHT because that also is one of the key topics for the forum. The, the official form that will start just now uh, until tomorrow. So this that was meant to be a side event to actually start the discussion and to, to feed that into the forum. So that's great. Thank you so much for all the panelists, Honorable Pepo, um, Tika, Maya, and, and Joshua and Wai for, for being with us today. That was really a thoughtful discussion, I think. Thank you for your questions and your, your comments on, on Zoom and on YouTube. Thank you again. Uh, we will actually put everything online on Countdown and on, uh, on Countdown 2030 Europe, the SW and EPF website. So you will see the studies we just mentioned and also um, maybe some other initiatives like the letter of requirements in the future. So thank you again. And let's discuss further how to do that and how to advance the SHR all together. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of the day. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.